Welcome back to the War Rooms, my beautiful people. I am your fight goddess, Chris Baldwin, and I am here in the War Room with my boxing family, Melissa Smith. She is a women's boxing historian. And my boy, Eddie Goldman, he is, we call him the conscious of combat sports. And we are in here today because um, we've had some breaking news with the IOC and their decision to uh, withdraw recognition of the IBA. So let's just jump right into this, Eddie. Please tell us what does that mean for our amateur boxers and, uh, you know, what's going to happen from here? Well, some of it is not particularly clear. Some of it is clear and some of it is not particularly clear. What immediately happened, and we've been discussing this for a long time, and you could read the whole history about the, the last couple of years, the the conflict between the IOC and how the IBA had already been suspended for about four years. The IBA put out what they said was a 400-page report telling the IOC that they had solved all the problems, met all the their criteria for lifting the suspension and so forth. And when they finally published the report, not 400 pages, but 34 pages, although they said it was edited, and was leaked to Reuters attacking the IOC. And who would have leaked it? Well, you know, usually somebody has an interest in leaking it. So you got to think that maybe it was the, the IBA that leaked it. In any case, this is now made public this uh, big attack on the IOC. And the IOC is something you just don't do with them. They're very autocratic and very protective of their brand. So they just completely uh, reacted to this. And a couple of days later, they announced that there would be an unscheduled executive board meeting. I, I think they probably did it uh, remotely. Um, on Wednesday, June 7th, to discuss the IBA. That was the, pretty much the only topic, I think, that came out of it. And the executive board and the IOC, they say, it's interesting they say the IOC executive board and the IOC president, like they're, they're all equal. The executive board is supposed to be running things. They're going to be convening what they call an extraordinary IOC session on Thursday, June 22nd. Now, there wasn't a full IOC session plan till October in India, which is sort of their regular uh, schedule of events. But they're doing this for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that's too, as they announced, the executive board of the IOC today recommended to the IOC session to withdraw recognition of the International Boxing Association. In other words, they're kicking IBA out of the Olympic movement, and they're not wasting any time with this. So the IOC also said some other interesting things. The executive board does want to keep boxing on the Olympic program in Paris 24, but they're going to be running it themselves. And they put out a long uh, report of their own, which I suggest people read. If you go to olympics.com slash IOC, there's the article, IOC Executive Board Recommends the IOC Session to Withdraw Recognition of the International Boxing Association. And linked to it is the uh, long report. Their comprehensive report dated uh, June 2nd, 2023. And there are a lot of interesting points in there. This was a defeat for the corrupt Russian sports olig oligarchs, such as uh, Kremlev and the people who have been funding him, such as Gazprom, the, the Russian mainly state-owned uh, energy monopoly. But it's only a partial victory. First of all, in this whole saga, much of the history has been omitted. A lot of this has been presented as if it just started a couple of years ago, maybe in uh, 2016 at Rio with uh, fixed matches. If you remember the, the Mick Conlon 
match against Nikita where Nikita where he beat up Nikita and they gave the Russian the victory and, and other fights like that. They did not go at all into the history how at least since the 1980s, you've had the same type of nonsense going on. But before uh, C.K. Wu took over, who all the blame is being put on, a guy named Chowdhury was running, was in Aiba, and you had the very famous fixed result in the Roy Jones fight in the Seoul 98 Olympics. You had many other examples of, of uh, fixed results and absurd results with Floyd Mayweather, a lot of people feel, was uh, robbed of a gold medal when he fought in the Olympics and many, many others. And they just sort of whitewashed it. Everybody sort of uh, is just pinning the blame on C.K. Wu or maybe just pinning the blame on Kremlev. This is something that's really been endemic long before Kremlev was around and, and on the scene. But what they did in this long report is they detailed some of the more uh, some of the more recent things that have gone on, and they talked about how the uh, elections that took place in May for the uh, for the IBA uh, declared five of the candidates ineligible or part of a block then known as the Common Cause Alliance that was opposed to Kremlev and the Court of Arbitration for Sports said you can't do that and they wouldn't let Boris Vandiverst run against Kremlev. And so while they couldn't order or didn't order new board elections, the the IOC, the IBA, rather membership, voted not to hold new elections for president and just ignored the advice on the board members. Then there were disputes about the qualification system for the Olympic Games in uh, in Paris in 24. But originally, the IOC hired uh, a number of people to deal with sports reform, including Isvan Kovac, who was a secretary general, and Professor uh, Haas, who was going to deal with a number of reforms. And one by one, they got rid of these people. In other words, they did what they did is they very loudly and publicly said, oh, look, at all, we're bringing all these people, some of whom are world-renowned experts. And then when things quieted down, they wouldn't let them finish the work, and, and they got rid of them. And th- this kind of thing went on. There was also, they, they changed the uh, s- statutes. They claimed that they were going to be setting up a boxing independent integrity unit and boxing tribunal. They said they were going to be diversifying their finances. That was a big thing that was raised by the IOC and bringing in an Australian company named Sting. But when there were attempts to audit the books of the IBA, they were not allowed to, the IOC was not allowed to use auditing firms like Price. Waterhouse and EY, which used to be known as Ernst Young, because the IBA wanted them to sign non-disclosure agreements, which would have kept these organizations from giving the results of this to the IOC in the first place. So there's no transparency where they're getting all this money to throw around and all, all this prize money or what their financial situation is. And they got a $50 million gas prom sponsorship deal and the iba then went on and said that they're not dependent on the ioc they're an independent organization and they began to more and more as we went to the end of 22 and beginning of 23 insult the ioc which is again something something that they don't like and what the ioc said what were initially obvious excuses to be uncooperative became open intimidation towards the IOC if it continued with the organization of the boxing tournament for uh, 2024. They only let one of the people recommended by the IOC have some access to their books, but all the members of the audit committee of the IBA resigned. Because, again, they brought them in. They weren't allowed to do their work. IBA said that they had uh, settled all their debts. They settled one set of debts, 
but there's another company called FCIT that they're in court with that has a debt that in U.S. dollars is over $26 million. That has not been settled at all. With Gazprom, they said that, oh, it, it the deal ended in December 31st, but there's no financial transparency. There's no reliability, and they haven't produced any information. And the IOC wrote, the IBA's reply did not produce any effective evidence of the signing of new contracts providing cash revenues. The contract with the equipment company Sting seems to be only value in kind. In other words, this company would give them equipment and so forth, but they wouldn't give them, they wouldn't get any revenue. And the, the IOC wrote that there was no source of revenue demonstrated by any signed contract. Then there was uh, the judging issues. They put in a review, but th that which would mean after if there's a, a challenge for the result of a fight, it could be reviewed. But they put in a rule that it must be concluded within five minutes after its activation. Now, these are generally nine minute fights. How can you review a nine minute fight in five minutes? It's obviously that they they were not serious about doing this. They IBA also didn't explain how their referee evaluator and observers uh, should pick the correct winner without rewatching the bout. So that again gives you a hint that there's a a lot of uh, underhanded stuff going on uh, behind the scenes. There were all sorts of other uh, issues, again, about involving the uh, referee and judges selection and all that's, that's going on. And at the very end of the report, there's a very startling statement that I think has been pretty much overlooked. Now, of course, our American boxing media, just a bunch of go gossip pages, and then repeat some press release, but not do any serious analysis of this. Towards the end of the, of the document, the IC writes, quote, the IBA, from the leadership to the majority of national federations, has not taken these opportunities that de demonstrate the lack of understanding and real willingness to evolve. And again, they're talking about the culture of corruption that has been going on at least since, in reality, since the 1980s. The IBA, from the leadership to the majority of national federations. So we've talked a lot about Russia and Kremlin. And they're the ones that are in charge now. But you had Rakhimov from Uzbekistan was was in charge at one point, and he's on the list, the U.S. Treasury Department, of being major international drug dealers. You have, you've gone from one corrupt leadership to another, and this has been supported by, and this has backed up the fact, the majority of national federations. So if the IBA is going to be ditched by the IOC, and there's going to be a new international federation, it's really going to have to reform the national federations too, and not just bring them in because it's just going to be the same same nonsense over and over again. Plus, the report left out a whole number of recent scandals. It only went up to the beginning of April, but a lot of this stuff took place. For example, the IBA let uh, fighters from Russia and Belarus compete under their own flag. They let all of them come in and under the, their, their own banners, whereas even the IOC's half-assed uh, ban says they have to compete as neutrals. So they changed that. And they also made fighters from the Netherlands because the, the, Nether the Dutch Boxing Federation had criticized IOC. They made them compete as neutrals and turn and the New Zealand fighters also uh, compete as neutrals and turn their jerseys inside out to cover up the flags where they are. The uh, IBA also excluded German journalists because the German boxing people were critical of the IOC. And they were running it basically like 
like Russia. So there was there's just a lot more that it's going on. And so now mm. world boxing has emerged as an alternative to it. But we can get into this. They got a lot of work to do. There are a grand total of two federations officially now in world boxing. And boxing is still off the program of 2028. And if the IOC is going to keep boxing on the Olympic program, they're going to need a robust international federation. So world boxing has an awful lot of work to do. We'll see whether they can do it. There might be a handful of other national federations have said they support what world boxing is doing, but they haven't, other than USA boxing and Swiss boxing, they haven't quit the IBA. So but, let me, let me, let me ask you, a, let me ask you this though, Eddie. So since the IBA will no longer be recognized, then the federations that are associated with them, why would they stay associated? Why wouldn't they sever ties with them and then join the world boxing organization? Because first of all, most of them are what is called ghost federations. They don't bring boxes to the Olympic movement or very few. You have something, I don't know exactly what the exact number, almost 200 uh, national federations. And a lot of them have, have supported Kremlev and they get a lot of money. They, the uh, IBA opens academies. They send them equipment and who knows what they do under the table. So they get mm. money for this. And each one of these tiny federations from Malawi and St. Lucia and all these places have one vote, just as a uh, USA boxing or England boxing, or whatever the USA in England, are number one and number three in terms of the amount of, of medals that they've gotten in Olympic Olympic boxing history. And I know Ireland is, is pretty high on that too. Number two is Cuba, which generally supports what the Russians are doing. But th this is why they stick around. The leaders get money. They're not going to be getting medals anyway. And if the, the, the Russians set up their so-called friendship games, they'll get some money thrown at them to compete in these events. IBA won't go away immediately, but they'll try to set up alternative events to compete with the Olympic movement. So it's mm. money for the money for the leaders. The other Thank issue you. is too, you, ha you have to have an opportunity for the athletes to compete on an elite basis uh, against as many teams as possible. And IBA has still been doing all of the, you know, the world championships on an annual basis. All right, the women's world championships were, were held this past March, but you know, which the United States did not go to because of the IBA. But on, on top of that, there were judging issues as late as the end of March. And they, there was a, uh, a, 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 I think a Danish referee that had to be dropped out of the uh, IBA world championships due to some egregious judging and complaints and it you know there are still those judges that were not removed those referees and judges that were not removed and there was a lot of concern with even you know in in this past march 2023 with all the alleged changes in governance by iba there were still lots of questions on the referee so i mean yes it was found to have occurred in 2016 it has certainly continued to occur after 2016, and as I said, as late as March 2023. So the issue here is going to be, okay, fine. IBA is no longer part of, will no longer be recognized as the organization providing uh, the leadership for um, Olympic boxing. But what happens to all the other competitions? What happens to the Junior Olympics? All the other things that are run through IBA currently, which gain a lot of support, from, which have many different countries participating. And while, yes, there are things like the European Championships and the Pan American Games and those kinds of regional um, competitions that could probably dissociate from um, IBA as sort of the, the overarching organization. Um, and there are also tests and, and all sorts of um, uh, competitions that occur with three or four different countries. You might have the USA versus China or USA and UK, whatever it works out to be. 
But these the integrity of these annual or biannual championships also has to be considered in all of this as we look beyond 2024, because right now, 2024 is right around the corner. IOC will be managing that. IOC will be managing all of the, um, the preliminaries. They will be establishing the criteria for participation in the trials for the Olympics and, and what that criteria is going to look like for uh, the, the international trials, um, which in the past years has been coupled with IBA World Championships. So all of those logistics will have to be worked out. But for 2028, Eddie is right. I mean, how how world boxing would be poised to manage all of that, have all of the organizations part of that and be managing not only the Olympics, but all of the other um, uh, competitions that happen and setting the ground rules for all of that, the governance of all of that, keeping all the associations in line so that the rules that are being followed in those competitions that are getting ready then to meet at the elite level internationally flow accordingly is really problematic and something that will need a tremendous amount of energy and support to do, and frankly, financial support. So how the World Boxing uh, Organization is gonna do that and what support they're gonna get from IOC how they're going to be able to fund this, um, and then work with their with the larger international partners, such as you know they already have USA Boxing on board, but getting UK Boxing, getting Australia, getting China, getting all of these major players who um, bring a lot of fighters to these events. India, as an example, brings a lot of fighters, and they they have a very strong amateur boxing organization. So how that is going to play out is is really uh, up in the air. And whether or not IOC is willing to take on continuing to manage the governance of Olympic boxing, another cycle until World Boxing Organization, as an example, gets its act together to be able to really do it in, in 2032 is a really, really big question. And the, the thing is, and the bottom line is it is the athletes who will suffer. And more uh -huh. than anything else, it is the women who will suffer the most. Yep. They Absolutely. have only been in this game since 2012. They've had three cycles. And to eliminate that opportunity is will be devastating to women in the sport and to all of the ground that has been made up and all of the constant effort for parity both uh, on the amateur side and more importantly on the professional side, which remains just abysmal with the exception right. of a few of the top tier fighters and certain promoters who are willing to put women on cards. Um, so it, it, it's something that is of tantamount of importance for the survival of the sport and for the ability for young men and young women to contest in the sport fairly let me give the opportunity to excel as amateur athletes in an amateur program that is clean and well-governed and not in it for political purpose and for sports washing lots of unknown dollars right. through these kinds of national organizations, which in and of itself always creates a corrupt practice. Because if you're accepting money from hmm, somewhere, we don't quite know where it is. Well, how does that really play out in the sport? Yeah, well, we've seen it play out with corrupt. Yeah, judges. and it's not been yeah. good. It's, it's not, not been good. good at all. Right. I, I've my experience is not as much in amateur boxing. A lot of it more comes from a wrestling. Is that the people running? Most of the people running amateur sports are very short-sighted. The ones that have broader visions, whether they're honest or corrupt end up going to professional sports of, of one sort or another and so you have this situation where the people running these amateur organizations their use their whole thing is the nuts and bolts of youth tournaments organizing tournaments but in terms of the governance and these other issues they're 
very few of them are really savvy about this type of thing. So you would think that it, by this point, the, it was very clear that at one point or another, the IOC was going to kick out IBA. You would think that if all these organizations are really interested in saving Olympic boxing, like they say, and knowing it can't be done through IBA, there would be a stampede to join world boxing. And that hasn't taken place yet. Even some of the, even since the, the announcement by the IBA that withdrawing recognition of, of, uh, of IOC, that they're withdrawing recognition of IBA. And that's going to happen. When the executive board says it, when Box says it, that, that's it. It's, it's already a settled issue. There's not going to be debate on this, you know, or much disagreement. It's, it's done. So you would think at this point, these, these federations, these national federations would do something other than a handful of them putting out a statement saying, oh, yeah, we think this is good. We have to save Olympic boxing, but we're not yet leaving IBA. But they, they're not doing that. And they're dragging their feet. They're still trying to get the, the last few crumbs off the table from the money that IBA is throwing around. And even then, it's not even all the members of the Common Cause Alliance that have had the leadership saying that, yeah, we think this is a good thing. I mean, you had some people from Ireland, from New Zealand, and, and a couple of other countries. But that's it. And it's may other than the U.S., it's mainly a couple of countries in Western Europe. It's not even all of them. This movement is corrupt through and through. And the IOC has said, and I, I tend to believe them on this, they will not organize the boxing at 2028 in Los Angeles. They, they've done it. It's unprecedented that they've done it twice for, for Tokyo, which is really in 2021. And again, up coming in 2024 in Paris. They're not going to do it. They just as soon get rid of boxing. They get rid of all these headaches, get rid of all these problems. Because of all this crap, they're having to call a special, extraordinary, full session of the IOC just to deal with this crap. There's, you know, a, a, a year before, a little over a year before Paris uh, Olympics start. There's so much more for them to focus on, and this just gives them bad publicity also. So they want to be done with it. And it might be also with other sports like weightlifting and modern pentathlon. We're going to see what happens with this. But the worst of them has been boxing under IBA. So why should they why should they really continue for LA? We know boxing will be popular in LA. If, they, if it's held in the LA Olympics, we know NBC wants it. That throws a lot of money around. But, you know, they could just as easily add, they want to add some of these so-called urban sports and skateboarding, which has, by the way, its own governance problems and, and scandals. But they want to add some of these other things that they think would attract younger, and it, they don't say this, but a wider fan base. So with all this, all these things, they would just want to wash the hands of it and unless world boxing can come along and show that they're going to going to do something and if, and if it's just a, a complete shadow organization if it if it barely exists it, by the time of the full IOC session in October when they're going to start to really decide a final program for 2028 what are they going to say so world boxing, IBA will still exist and hold its events. They will not have any bearing on Olympic qualification. World boxing says they will hold their own tournaments and their events. And they just might be another international federation that's uh, not part of the Olympic program. They're like, I, I don't know, like over 100 of these federations are all sorts of different Sports is sambo and handball and, and squash and on and on right. muay thai and oh. jujitsu and all these other sports that have that run their own that run yeah, their right. own events and not part of the Olympic program. And that this yeah. is where 
boxing could end up unless unless they get their shit together fast. But I, I just don't see it from these amateur people. I just, just you know, I'm there's not surprised. One thing that's interesting, though, is that, you know, Duncan McKay at uh, Inside the Games, you know, which is the Oregon kind of reporting on, on all things Olympic sports, his uh, he had a piece out today, and, and which I'll just quote the the title: "Exclusive the IBA call emergency meeting to discuss expulsion, as IOC seemed to confirm boxing will be included at Los Angeles 2028." His perspective is the 24 page document that the I that uh, the IOC put out the, what we quoted before the comprehensive report on the IBA, his contention is that this report seems to imply that boxing will be in Los Angeles in 2028. I didn't see it, but he seems to call it that way. So I guess we'll it's, really learn more on the 22nd of June. It, it's item number 100. If it, it's the very last line, it says that, um, the additional consequence of this situation that the IBA has not addressed to the satisfaction of the IOC, the ongoing concerns around its governance, financial transparency and sustainability, and the integrity of its refereeing and judging process, is that the IBA should not organize the Olympic Games LA 28 boxing tournament. So Hmm. that, when I read that, I I was like, okay, they're going to have a boxing tournament, yeah. So they're going (laughs) to, so yeah. I guess that's where he gets it from then. They're yep. just don't, not going to have IBA do it. And the question is, I guess, as we said before, who will, does, does IOC take it on, you know, take it on the chin one more time or do they put World Boxing Organization, give Boris a chance to to govern it the right way and, yeah, why and not handle contract that out? aspect of it? They're, right. they're lying through their teeth. Once again, <laughs> there's a whole history of this where they put mm-hmm. out a, a so-called list of qualified boxers for the upcoming uh, European games. They have no say in who's qualified to go to the European games. They put out what they said were Olympic qualifying events. They have no say in Olympic qualifying events. The IOC came, had their own list of Olympic qualifying events. And this confused a lot of people. This is what, this is like Russian propaganda tactics. And now they say that boxing is guaranteed at Los Angeles 2028. No, no, that's what IOC is saying. No, IOC has never, never said that. They No, it's just, well, what they said, here's the line, and this is what's confusing, and this is what Duncan is claiming. This means IOC is going to put boxing in 28. The last nine is, is that the IBA should not organize the Olympic Games LA boxing tournament. So Duncan at you know inside the games is interpreting that to mean, oh, we're going to have boxing in 2028. It's just that IBA won't be doing it. Doesn't say that. All it says is that... That, if that there is boxing not, in 2028, they're not going to do it. Exactly. Which box, means the, somebody else would have to do it. Well, no, and the IOC understood. said they're not, they're not going to do it themselves. I know. And will That's world boxing be in a position that soon? That is the question. That's to do the it. Question. That well, is the the IBA question. just IOC just washed the hands of the whole thing. So, yeah, or they're giving World Boxing Organization the open, right? It's an open, open they, to take right, care to of it. Come, yeah. To come in and step up. I mean, give the guys a chance. I would give W uh, World Boxing Organization at least a chance. You know, do they, they, are, do, they yes. do that? Yeah. And that and, and I, that's all. I guess that's the point that Duncan McKay was making in his article well, today. There was but also I don't know. an exposure a while ago by USA Boxing that the key uh, the company that owns inside the games is financed by Kremlev. And this no, is I, I, I been discussed I, that a I lot. remember. But, yeah. oh, but, but this I, is where it, this is where this is where that statement at the end of the IOC report that's buried is so important where they don't blame just Kremlev. They said the IBA from the leadership to the majority majority yes. of the national federations they're fed up with the whole with the majority with a lot of them 
not yeah, just no. one guy, not just not just Russia. They're fed up with with all of them. And if the majority of the national federations are, you know, have shown, as they say, a lack of understanding and real willingness to evolve, they don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. The, oh, I think they yeah. pretty much decide this to me. This is what the IOC says, not what Duncan McKay and the IBA interpret the IOC is saying. This is what the IOC is saying in their own in their own report. They're you saying know. IBA is toast. That we get. The question right. is, will they give world boxing That's a o- shot it's o- yes. at 2028? That's yes, or, but it's or very- take it over themselves one more time for the team. No, they will, will not take it over them. They said that. This is unprecedented that they've had to do this two, two, two Olympics cycles. in a row. They're yeah. not going to do it. They're not going to do it again for Los Angeles. So they're giving, they're going to give world boxing a shot. But my point is that the majority of the national federations are full of shit. And even the ones that are supportive of what's been going on, you know, should have get off the pot. And they haven't quit IBA and told them to fuck off, except for USA boxing and Swiss boxing. What about what are these other federations? Yeah, yeah. Where's the UK? Exactly. And where's yeah. Ireland? And they were Ireland, the Irish Boxing Association. They were really big, big, um, you know, had a lot to say about the IBA. And so why haven't they quit? Well, they have their own issues, but. I, well, I, I, I would I would say now that the IOC has made this announcement and they're not going to recognize the IBA, it's a perfect opportunity for the for UK and the Irish to just like, yeah. OK, let's just because now they have a reason, you know, now they right. have a reason. Right. They have the context. And, the, you know, and I'm sure Boris right. is work, working the phones to every single organization. Absolutely. To the leadership to say, hey, OK, this is where it's going to go. Right. The, the IOC. In order for a sport to be an Olympic sport, you have to have an international federation that is worldwide, not just one that covers a sport that's just regional or popular just in a few in a few countries. I mean, there are lots of examples that I, that I mentioned. Sambo, for example, is popular in Russia. And Eastern Europe and the former Soviet republics. Outside of that, it's tiny and doesn't really exist. This is a, excluding the whole issue of Russia itself. This is separate from that. Jiu-Jitsu is another sport. They're just a handful of countries that really active in the Jiu-Jitsu International Federation. And you could go on and on with a lot of other sports. Squash is popular in certain countries, but not enough even though it's applied in a number of times, to become an Olympic sport. There are all these other sports out there. They all say they want to join the Olympics, but they they don't have enough support. If world boxing is going to have 10 or 20 members, I don't care what those countries are. They're not going to put it on the Olympic program. They're going to have to have Mm -hmm. well over 100, 150 members and where the hell is that going to come from with these national federations? So they, they got a lot of work to do. But I, I right now, I think the odds are the odds are against them. They'll be. Yes, the IOC is giving them a shot, saying, get your shit together. We can't do it for you. You got to do it. And people like Boris Van der Voorst and, and uh, Steve Hartley and others, we know, are working to do that. And right. some of the people in USA Boxing, Tyson Lee, Mike McAtee, and some of the others, but it's it's a small number of people, and mostly again from the the more developed uh, Western European countries, the U.S., Australia, even Canada hasn't come out and spoken on this. Although so, GB Boxing now, I, I just was reading that they've. Uh, they are intending to apply for what they're calling associate membership because gb sure boxing yeah because gb but. boxing represents england wales and scotland yep, yep. england the the way it's set up the boxers themselves will represent england wales or scotland now they'll train together and they'll have the gb boxing facilities 
uh, with right. Rob McCracken and Sheffield and, and all of that. But they don't they, they will become an associate member because they will not technically be a national federation, such as the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. Right. Mm -hmm. USA boxing and so forth. That's why. But where's England, Wales, and Scotland? You know, yeah, should it well, get off the pot? Yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, with GB coming climbing on board with, I think after the meeting on June 22nd is when we really start to see stuff right. moving on. And, 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 and the, a lot of these countries that have been sitting on the fence will, will really have to jump. These are the ones that already support the goals of world boxing and were against Kremlin and the IBA leadership, and they're not having joint world boxing. What about all the is, is the IOC said the majority of national federations that have supported Kremlin? The the one thing they ran their elections, and you could if you followed that stuff, the these elections were done. Oh, by openly, by open, by open ballot, you could see who voted for whom, and a lot of statements were put out. The, well, yeah, the fact that, that the Boris couldn't even get on, on the, they wouldn't, the vote to not even allow an election showed exactly where everything was. And as you pointed out earlier, you know, Kremlin, the Russians, whatever, all that money is giving these smaller organizations money that they wouldn't ordinarily have. And therefore, they're beholden to Kremlin and company and support them. They're in their block because they're getting money. That's all it's about. That's the bottom line. Yeah. That's and so you line. have the situation where we've discussed this before, but it has to be reiterated that the implications of boxing being dropped from the Olympic program for LA 2028 are absolutely enormous because the, the way the IOC works, they can't wait too long to make that final program because it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle of schedules. They have to get the venues organized. They have to get the dates coordinated. They have to have all the international federations, all the... <clears throat> The officials, uh, the broadcasting, they have to get all that stuff worked out. And it takes a few years to do that. It used to be, it used to be seven years. If you remember wow. what happened with wrestling, they were temporarily, although it was later restored, dropped from the Olympic program for 2020 in early 2013. They were later restored that year for 2020, which is a whole a different, I, I could get into that another point because I was sort of in, in the middle of that for a while. This is a very different issue. This is only only five years before. They got to get they got to get this done, and that's where the IOC session in October in in, uh, in Mumbai there will be a, a a decision that is likely final to be made. So they're, they're up against the clock. And if it's 50, just 15, 10 or 15 members in world boxing, I don't know what they might put them on the program sort of temporarily and give them a couple of years to get, get their act together. I'm not sure what they're going to do, but uh, it, it's just an awful lot of work that that. Uh, and then after that, you got to get officials. Who are your officials going to be? A lot of these crooked officials have been working for years under the uh, exactly. control of the IBA. So you're just going to bring these these same people over and just call them world boxing. So how you have to train a whole generation of officials now? So yeah, it could be it could be done, but it's very difficult. Well, I have faith in Boris and the team over there, World Boxing Organization. Let's go, team. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, hope they get this stuff together, but right now you would have you would have thought there would be a lot more going on. You would have thought well, they they would be putting out, they would have been using the media and social media more. To me, they look sort of like a skeleton organization. They don't have much of a budget. It took them over a day to post their statement on their own their own website. The social media only has a smattering of followers that could really use 
help in this regard. Right. That's what I mean about amateur organizations. Yeah. They, they need the money. They hire those teams. And the expertise and, and the vision. All right. Exactly. Yeah. I think vision is very important. I think that's well said. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So uh, you guys want to hit cover anything else before we get out of here, Eddie? There's just so much else going on in world sport. I just did an article on Patreon about, and this broke right before the whole golf situation came up, how Alexander Usyk is now signed a co-promotional deal with Skill Challenge Promotions, which is run by uh, Prince Khalid of Saudi Arabia and what this, why this was done and what this really means for the sport uh, of, of professional boxing. Oh. We're seeing just in general, the growth of the influence of uh, Saudi Arabia with the now merging in golf, which is a sport I really don't follow. So I'm reading up on this. So I have to sort of uh, figure out a little bit what's going on, but with the major organizations, the PGA tour and the LIV golf, which the Saudi Arabia set up, which were at loggerheads and in court with each other and each accusing each other of uh, antitrust violations, all of this, now they're going to be merging into one to oh, basically my word. completely dominate men's golf. There's just an awful lot, an absolute change going on where, again, I can't really comment too much on golf because I don't follow it either as a sport or the business or the governance very much. But I can tell you in boxing, because as we've discussed, because it's been so screwed up, and so short-sighted and, and so fucking stupid in terms of the way professional boxing is run that Saudi Arabia could come in and start to bring in top-level fighters like Alexander Usyk. They've also, is promotional, is now a promotional company competing with Matchroom and Top Rank and all that. They also have signed Badu Jack, who's a WBC cruiserweight champion and has been a, a top fighter for, for you know for many many years and is internationally known and they're looking to bring in more fighters supposedly they're working on a mega card in December which could bring in top heavyweights Anthony Joshua's fought there a couple of times maybe and you know who knows how much this is just smoke and mirrors but this talk of Joshua fighting Wilder maybe Usyk fighting Joshua who knows if any of this is going to take place but these are the plans that this that this company has and there's a real change in what's going on and in boxing it's because things in in the US and the UK and Europe are so screwed up they put everything behind paywalls the the people just aren't fighting maybe every 18 months or 2 years you just don't see the top fights take years and years to be made taking place years after they should have happened and people just get fed up with it and they don't want to pay 80 or 90 dollars just to watch one fight that's going to last 20 minutes and other than the, the women who it's you know Melissa and others have pointed out they're all fighting each the top women are all fighting each mm -hmm. other and the men People are just fed up with this. And on top of it, the, every week there's some other outrageous decision that's taken place. One corruption or another, top fighters not fighting because they've been caught doping, which is only a fraction of the people doping. Uh, loot television deals being lost. PBC lost its Fox deal. Remember when they used to be on all these different networks? No ESPN Friday night fights. They have occasional fights on ESPN, but they move more of the better fights to pay-per-view. Showtime just puts their better fights on, on pay-per-view. It just gets it just gets worse and worse. So the Saudis can come in with these boxes and say, we're going to overpay you four or five times more than you we get elsewhere. And of course they're going to go, their careers are short. They're going to, they're going to take the money. So it's just a very, very bad situation with all of this. I'm kind of pessimistic about both professional and amateur boxing. It could be turned around, you know, 
we shall see what happens. But we got to keep fighting on the issue of governance, which is almost never mentioned in boxing. And this whole move to create something like a, a world anti-corruption agency, although they, they want to call it a different name now, is something that's, I think, particularly important. There's, a, If you look at uh, Play the Game, had a long article about this new proposal to create something called Clearing Sport, which is kind of an awkward name. But I suggest people look at playthegame.org to read about this, that there's some very slow and steady but larger movement to creating some kind of anti-corruption agency for sport. And we'll see where all this goes. We've got to keep pushing. All right on. All right. So let's, uh, we, you know, I think that's all we have for you guys today. Let's wrap this up. Melissa, I just, you wanna... Oh, go ahead. I have one more thing, which is that this is the International Boxing Hall of Fame weekend. And uh -oh. I want to have a huge, huge, huge shout out to Alicia Slick Ashley and Laura Serrano, who are being inducted this year. And right to Joanne Hagen, who um, is a pioneer boxer from the 1950s in Indiana, boxed out of South Bend, Indiana. In particular, wow. Alicia Ashley was the oldest boxer, male or female. She beat out Bernard Hopkins by a few months to win a vacant w, vacant world championship belt at the age of 48. Wow. She finally retired from boxing at 50. She is awesome. Laura Serrano from Mexico, Mexico City, took up boxing, went to law school, still continued to box, made boxing legal in Mexico City, in Mexico, 1999. That is why yes. boxing is legal in Mexico. She, her first fight in the United States was, her first pro fight was against um, Christy Martin. And arguably, you watch that fight, you say, Serrano won. Awesome, wow. awesome, awesome fighter. Wow. She was also, uh, she was managed by Don King for a while, early in her career. Anyway, these two women are extraordinary. They are going to be recognized this weekend, along with Timothy Bradley, Carl Froch, Raphael Marquez. So it's a really great class of, wow. of boxers that are coming in this year. Joe Goosen on the on the management All side. Right, uh, Beth Abraham, Tim Ryan, Brad Jacobs, Brad Goodman. So really, really awesome. So happy. And in particular for Alicia Ashley, I've trained with her. She is the most remarkable human in the world. And uh, Denison of uh, Weeson's Gym and, and one of the 17 women or 16 women and counting who are world champions. Wow. World champion in Dumbo, That's Brooklyn. incredible. Incredible awesome, history. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Right. Oh, well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Eddie, for that analysis on this IOC IBA situation and Melissa for, you know, that's a, the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Congrats to everyone out there. Uh, you know, looking forward to uh, seeing your, are you going to that this weekend? I wish I could. I, I unfortunately, I can't get away, yeah. but, but uh, we'll see the pictures I'll be on there Instagram. And, yeah. And, right. and, and they'll, it'll be on YouTube and uh, right, so on. Right, right, right. Right on. Well, look folks, that is all we have for you guys today. And uh, Melissa, you want to tell the people where they can find you? Sure. I'm at Girl Boxing now. I am at Girl Boxing on Instagram and, and Twitter. Uh, I'll put a plug for my new book. I, I have an article, uh, an essay entitled uh, How Boxing Uncaged Me in a new book called The Difference, Essays on Lost Courage and Personal Transformation. It is available on um, Amazon.com and uh, the week of Kindle. June 12th. You can get it on Kindle for $1.99. <laughs> ah, sold. <laughs> 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 Woohoo. Yeah. That's a Thank deal. You. All right. On, right on. All right, Eddie. Tell the good people where they can find you, my brother. Yeah, I mentioned my Patreon site earlier, patreon.com slash Eddie Goldman. If you want independent journalism to survive, support that because you're not getting it on, on any of these websites. You're getting on these sites, people just repeating nonsense that promoters are feeding to them and planting stories or just some very uh, rewritten press releases. And 
you know, or just some fight reports, things like this. You want some real analysis, support this because it's 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 absolutely necessary and it's very very rare that uh, that exists in in boxing writing today and and I'm trying to do some good writing as as well which you also don't see on these websites it's a, probably more endemic in uh in general culture and um my uh site is eddiegoldman.com and still on twitter that's where the action is until this this clown completely destroys it but he hasn't completely destroyed it and i haven't seen any real viable alternatives particularly when it comes to discussing combat sports so maybe something will come uh, maybe it won't so for the moment at nhb news on twitter and i'm here in smoky new york city <laughs> Right on. Well, look, everyone, you guys can find me on Twitter in our own little boxing cubicle. OK, boxing corner of the world on Twitter at Angry Afro Radio. And I'm on Instagram at Fight Goddess Fitness. So you guys check us out. Also check us out at War Sports. That's W-A-A-R Sports dot com. You can see all our latest uh, videos on YouTube and all of that good stuff. So you guys give us a follow and subscribe. Until next time, peace, love, and push-ups. Boom. All right, good. And that's a wrap.